Okay, howdy folks. It's another game from the Great Canadian Open. Uh, so we got Obiuscus versus uh, Bogler. Uh, Obiuscus is already in the game. I'm sure Bogler will be joining us uh, shortly. The scenario is uh, Game of Thrones. And I guess uh, while we're waiting for the game to load, let us take a look at the objectives. Um, so we got plus one hand size. Very important. Uh, after making an attack, the opponent becomes weakened, not quite as good. On this side, we've got Mimic Dice Gain Sundering, again, not super relevant. Uh, roll highest attack value, not super relevant. And in the middle, we've got Attack Gain Precision. So the problem for any newer players uh, is that most of these objective cards don't matter. Um, they don't often kick in. Sometimes they do, and they'll give you a little bit of an edge. Uh, but Often you're just sitting on it, not attacking, so you don't get any real benefit out of it. Whereas this one here does have an effect. You get to draw an extra card and cycle through your deck a little bit better. Um, the other card that's relevant, I believe, is the healing one. It's pretty good. There's also a card that throws out a vulnerable token. So any card that lets you camp on it and give you a bonus or the one that's favored. So as a result, this side here towards uh, Obiscus, Ob Obiscus, do apologize for mispronouncing that name is slightly favored uh this is overall an improvement though like it's not a huge advantage this is i'm comparing to 1.6 where the cards were way more swingy there was a card that literally turned up an ncu back then and that could literally make or break the game uh so i, I prefer it this way but it is important to note that most of these cards really don't do too much um cool so it looks like they've loaded up their armies we've got free folk versus targaryens i believe Let's take a look at uh, Bogler's army. I wonder if it's the same or different well, than the one that we saw earlier. So looks like it is the same. Okay, so he's got Commander Mance in Trappers. Uh, so Mance is a very popular, if not the most popular, free folk commander. The reason why is because he gets around one of their biggest weaknesses. So he provides an aura of morale 5 within short range. Uh, and he's in Trappers, which heavily implies that he'll be deployed behind his army, and he's able to influence three or four units at the same time, which is pretty great. Um, trappers with their Hidden Traps ability. Is it still called Hidden Traps? Hold on one sec. Uh, trappers with their... It is called Hidden Traps ability. Um, can still affect the battlefield since it's long range, so uh, very popular unit to put Mance in. We've got three units of Raiders, cheap four-point activations with Raid Leaders, Raiders are not to be underestimated. Um, they are, first of all, cheap and insignificant, so if they die, it's not a big deal. You can produce, you know, up to two more trays with the Endless Horde. Um, and their attack profile is really not to be sniffed at because they have six texting on fours, which is definitely subpar. But the gang up rule means that they'll be getting seven attacks hitting on threes, which is really the equivalent of a lot of uh, elite units that are worth six or even seven or even eight points. If you think about it, Seven attacks hitting on threes is exactly the attack profile of Blood Riders. And people are gaga about Blood Riders, so this gives you the attack power effectively of Blood Riders. Um, combine that with Sire NCU, which I know he takes. Sire gives you another attack in Sundering. So your basic Raider unit, when it's ganging up, can get eight attacks hitting on through the Sundering, which is an incredibly good profile on a four point cheap throwaway unit. So really, um, uh, you know really not to be underestimated. I don't know if I would take three raid leaders. Uh, it's good to have a little bit of variety, but not a bad choice for sure. We've got more trappers to add a little bit of extra chip damage through hidden traps. Um, they're also mobile. They move in six, which means that they can also be used to gather objectives. Their shots can do some chip damage. And then we've got the ever-present spearwives. Spearwives are a key piece in free folk armies because of the coordination tactics card let, let's you share their coordinated assault rule. So coordinated assault means that when they charge, they deal one extra hit, automatic hit. So imagine a world where free folk raiders with a raid leader ganging up, get the charge in with eight attacks, hitting on threes with sundering due to stire, and then deal an extra hit, so three extra hits, because of coordinated assaults, which you can share with the tactics card coordination tactics. Uh, so it just makes for a really cool wombo combo um, potential, uh, but it requires to have the right hand, it requires the right setup. Um, so 
you know, I, I actually think we will cover a very, very high skill cap. You just need to know how all the pieces come together. We've got Harma in here, which is a very significant piece. I have to remember that she's got the Sentinel rule, which lets you charge. Um, I, I completely kind of overlooked that last game that I, I watched with Boggler. Um, but such a mobile piece gives the Superior's movement 6 effectively and the ability to redeploy very quickly through enhanced mobility. Pivoting and marching can give you tons of movement, and of course that's enhanced with um, your Gret NCU, which gives them another plus one movement during the early game. So they can literally pivot at March 14 and just redeploy. Uh, you can also move again on the tactics board of the Val. So you influence first with your Gret, and then the you know fourth or fifth zone you use Val to get another free seven inch move. You can really redeploy with the Spear Rise. So they're almost like cavalry in a certain sense like that. Um, so that is Bogler's Force. And let's take a look at Obiscius. Uh, not quite deployed yet. Uh, he's not in the game chat either, so maybe what I'll do is I'll take a quick look at his lists on um, TT or, or on the A Song of Ice and Fire stat site. So let me rewind a little bit and open up his lists. Um, let's see here. There he is. Okay. And let me switch the view. to the song sites. All right, perfect, cool. Okay, so um, here we have uh, Obiskis's two Targaryen lists. We've got Cal Drogo in the ever popular Blood Riders, Rhaegal as the dragon. Uh, I think Rhaegal and Drogon are definitely the top two picks since the normal token on uh, Viserion's not incredibly relevant, uh, and it's a real debate on which one do you take. Do you take Drogon for the extra damage, or Rhaegal for the weakened token, which is kind of like backwards healing? Um, I, I think I prefer Rhaegal overall. He's a more safe bet, I find. Uh, the panic token doesn't always make a difference. The weakened usually does. We've got Outriders, which are fantastic support fire. Jor Morma to give the Outriders uh, consistency with rerolls and precision. Can also give that to Grogo as well. Uh, and Freeman, which is a very key piece to get to eight activations. Um, eight activations in a dragon with assault orders can really lead to a lot of consecutive attacks. Um, and we've got um, pretty typical NCUs for healing, Illyrio and Tycho. Uh, healing is so strong, um, and you can see it in Night's Watch and uh, Greyjoys and Targaryens. And then we've got a very um, interesting NCU choice with Daenerys Targaryen, the Unburnt, who gives you an extra attack, essentially, by replacing the zone. Now, this is a hard NCU to use properly because, obviously, people want to avoid getting attacked more than once or twice. Now, what I really like about Obiscius's list is that with eight activations, you can set up the, the tempo turn, the tempo turn where you get the last activation and then the first activation. Now, I say that, of course, except he's playing Free Folk, who are one of the few factions that can easily have more activations than eight, and sure enough, Boggler has nine. But generally speaking, eight is what most people aspire to. So you can usually finish the turn with a charge with Rhaegal. And there's so many ways to get unsurprising, sorry, to get surprising charges via uh, Swift Reposition and Fire and Blood to get these long bomb charges in and um, into an attack into Swords next round. Now, Daenerys gives you the option to also attack through the tactics board but it's tricky to use because if you charge Rhaegal in early before the tactics board is full your opponent can simply retreat and then you really can't use Daenerys if you are doing a tempo turn where you charged in last activation of Rhaegal get an attack and now it's your activation well instead of using Daenerys you can always take the sword right so I guess in that case if you take the sword what do they do? They can't retreat because Rhaegal can still charge. They probably take the bag. And then they just have to wait, essentially. And if they take the bag, I guess that's a case where you could use the Unburned to attack a second time. Uh, so maybe maybe that's actually the use of Daenerys Targaryen. So, you know, an extra dragon attack is humongous. Dragon attacks are the most powerful attacks in the game for the most part because they're so consistent. They're always going to deal four to six wounds plus a panic test. Um, so, yeah, you know, I can maybe see that being quite useful. Um, okay, so moving on to the second list, we got Grey Worm. 
Grey Worm and his Unsullied Pikeman, very, very common. We've got a very expensive unit in Dothraki Veterans with Rakaru. Dothraki Veterans, if you watched uh, the, 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 the stream last night, I didn't stream live, but I was showing the game on Discord, uh, you know, have amazing burst potential with Jorah Mormont. You know, um, Tom Tyler played Mitch and, and used the Veterans masterfully to, um, to defeat Mitch. Now, I don't know if you want Rakaro only because it creates a 10-point activation that is pretty squishy with a 5-plus save. You know, now, Sentinel on a unit that has quick fire can lead to even more combinations. So I don't deny that it's very, very powerful, but it's definitely going to limit, A, your activation count, and B, um, it, it makes this unit even more of a priority to kill. So I'm very curious to see how, how well he uses this 10-point this unit. You've got Jorah to provide all the, again, um, combos with precision and rerolls to the veterans. Um, and you've got Stormcore Mercenaries with Jack and Hagar. Now, I've seen Jack and Hagar been taken before. I think the reason why you take Jack and Hagar is to replace your commander should your commander get killed by something like Expert Duelist. Now, it could be mistaken. Maybe there's a plan otherwise. But yeah, this is how Jack and Hagar is normally used is, you know, in a meta where Drogo is a real thing. If Graham was to get killed, you can resurrect your commander essentially um, through Jack and Agar, who can bring back an infantry attachment. Um, we also got a Freeman trait, so we've got five combat activations, and he still has eight activations. So you know what? I take it back. I'm very impressed that he's able to fit in this ten point piece and still have eight activations. We got the typical healers, and we got the other version of Daenerys, where she removes a token, kind of like Caitlyn for the Starks, and then re-roll your dice. Rerolling your dice is good. Um, in general, there's no power piece that needs rerolls here, like Flayed Men or Blood Riders or anything like that. But, uh, you know, Unsullied Pikemen are still just fine, you know, hitting on threes or seven dice to reroll with. Or even the Veterans is fine too. So I, I really like this version of Daenerys because she just gives you consistency through removal of tokens and um, rerolling your attack dice. Now, I hear some shuffling in the background. I imagine that means that they are in the game now. So let me switch back the view to uh, Tabletop Simulator. And I'm curious which list did uh, Obiskius end up taking. So it looks like he ended up taking his Grey Worm list, I believe. Yes, Grey Worm. Uh, now, let's talk, about, let's talk about the lists in context of the scenario, right? Now, I think for Free Folk, I believe Boggler is running double... Mance, and the lists aren't too crazy different. I think he has a Frozen Shore Chariot with Tormin, but it's still mostly Raiders and Trappers and Superiors and stuff. So this army, I think, is perfectly fine for, for the scenario. You've got lots of cheap trades that can hold objectives, um, lots of trades that can contest the middle. Is this Targaryen, in fact, like, why was this Targaryen army chosen um, versus Khal Drogo? Um, both of eight activations. Um, now, I suppose the reason why this might have been chosen is because the scenario gives you plus one point for holding an objective, you can park this seven point unit on a corner objective and score two points. It's not the best use, and I'm going to be very excited when that rule goes away uh, in end of, uh, end of January, hopefully, because it's kind of boring, obviously, to put your commander in a bunker and just sit them. You'd rather see Grey Worm up front, you know, Contesting the center, for example. So I wonder if um, uh, Obiskius is going to use him to turtle, or will he be aggressive with them? Um, he has another cheap unit that can kind of hold an objective, being the Storm for Mercenaries. The Freeman, unfortunately, cannot hold objectives. Um, and then he will contest the center, presumably, with Dothraki veterans uh, supported by Jorah. Now, Dothraki veterans, especially with Jorah's... Uh, is, was it... Openings, something about openings. Scout openings rule is actually one of the few units in the game that can one shot a tray because they have 14 attacks, re rolling with precision due to Jorah. Um, so they can just one shot uh, free folk trades. So we'll see if this is going to be enough. Or will maybe Jorah camp on a corner objective and maybe um, the pikemen and veterans go forward? So I saw them dice off. I imagine it's going to be terrain placement. And oh yes, we've got some bogs and some stakes. Now, I imagine that the bogs were placed by Bogler. 
Bogs are a very good defensive piece for Free Folk because they blunt the charges um, without providing the negative effects of the Corpse Pile. Corpse Piles also have the Hindering Rule, but of course they have the uh, Horrific Rule as well. Uh, and generally speaking, Targaryen units have such good morale that the Horrific Rule doesn't really kick into play. Um, the, you know, the, the um, whatchamacallit, what's the word? The frontline Targaryen units, such as Unsullied and uh, Dothraka units, have morale 5 and 4, so they're not so crippled by the minus 1 to their um, their, uh, their their panic. They might put those corpse piles. But we see instead uh, a stakes and a forest. Now, the forest is very interesting. And you know what? The placement here reminds me a lot of Tom Tyler Winter, Winter's Cummings placement. Um, we've seen him use the forest as a bunker to hide their commander behind because if you charge through the forest with the fortified rule you get plus one to your save so i wonder if this is a a, a a note out of tom's book and the stakes are great for shrinking the battlefield making it harder for the free folk to um to surround your opponent and because targaryens have a card called um unstoppable advance they can actually destroy the stakes when they need to get through it which is pretty awesome so uh, it looks like the forest couldn't quite fit. It was just under six inches. So it looks like he's chosen another stake to probably restrict the movement of the free folk again. So, yeah, we have the one side here that had slightly better. So um, it looks like the terrain's fairly central. Note that you can put this bog over the center objective. You know, you, you can put terrain over objectives. You can even put stakes over objectives to make it harder for both players to catch it. So I better put this directly over the middle, and it looks like this stake is 0.1 too close. I mean, yeah, there we go. He's moving back a little bit. It makes the board asymmetric. It does mean that the free folk, if they take this side with a better card, uh, will be slowed down a little bit as they have to break the stake first. Uh, so is asymmetric is good, I think, because it means that the roll for side is actually significant. If the table is completely symmetric. You know, you don't care who gets side, and you care more about who's going first player. But, you know, this train piece is slightly significant. The good thing for Free Folk is um, if they get this side, they've got so many units. And honestly, the sword is not very high priority round one that you can just break this round one, probably. And Targaryens generally don't care because they usually have so much cav, they can just move six and blow it up. Now, in this case, he only has one cav unit, but... Turn one is generally also, I should say turn one, round one is generally also not super high impact. So um, you can slow down for a turn and just blow it up. So I don't think this will be a huge piece due to the nature of the two armies. Jorah and the veterans can blow it up turn one. And again, with so many activations um, and swords not being a priority, you can easily blow up the stakes turn one as well. Um, as such, maybe it would have used another piece of the corpse pile, which would have more lingering effects. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see if the stakes ends up being destroyed early game or not. Well, oh, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Chrono. Let's check in the chat now. Okay, so it looks like terrain's pretty much down, and they're about to dice off for choice of first player uh, and choice of side. And let me take a big slurp of coffee. I'm going to mute myself as I do so. Mmm, coffee. So terrain looks good. Should be dicing off. Turning it 2D. Is the terrain locked in? Looks locked in. Okay, sweet. <laughs> I can already see some uh, some mislicks here. The Freeman already have some wounds, apparently, from, from beyond. Okay, so dicing off for choice of side or first player. Uh, now, while they're dicing off, I, I, I want to just preemptively say, in a scenario like this, 
I think it's a two. <laughs> I think it's a two. Uh, I generally like to go first because I want to go first round three. And I've said this many times uh, in, in other videos. Um, because you start scoring end of two, what normally happens... What is going on here? <laughs> what normally happens is one player will claim the center round two. And then if you have the last say, you can charge in to maybe contest, deal some damage... And then go first round three and take the swords to do even more damage without having to activate. Uh, this is especially true for the free folk who heavily, I should say heavily, it's nine versus eight activations. Uh, but they can get more activations through um, Endless Horde. Now, uh, it looks like, it looks like, um, I imagine Obiskius won and, oh wait, hold on, I shouldn't say that. It looks like Bogdor won, probably. I think Bogdor wanted the side with plus one hand size. Um, and I was going to say Endless Horde is a thing that can extend the activation advantage, except, of course, you're playing the one faction that can destroy your plans, which is Targaryens who have field control. So we'll see if uh, we're going to get those super bad feels bad moments where the field control cancels out the uh, Endless Horde. Yes, yeah, so the other objectives are all uh, in melee, sundering, precision, uh, max dice, and weakened. So su not super relevant. Um, plus one card is going to be probably the most relevant for a while. Now, the pikemen are very durable, so they can probably sit on an objective, get charged, tank the damage, and then fight back. So they might actually take advantage of a card, should it happen. But I predict in this scenario... Um, the Free Folk are going to try and hold to Contessa Center, which is very typical. And I wonder how will Obiskius, um react? Will he play similar, or will he focus on one flank to avoid facing the entirety of the Free Folk army? Right? I think that's probably smarter. If you try and compete with them across the, across the way, you will probably get overwhelmed. But if you can focus your attention on one flank... Um, you might be able to over, overcome their advantage of numbers. So it looks like uh, we're getting some raiders going down first. Good deployment. You know, you want to put down your cheap use of stuff first. And Obiskius is doing something very similar, which is awesome. Loving the um, deployment of the chaff first, as it were. Like that a lot. Now, I am interested to see that he's not putting him on the line. I wonder if that is deliberate. I don't see a reason why not putting him on the line. You're very, very far apart in this case. I don't always put my free men on the line. I sometimes put them behind a tray, so I measure out a tray and put them behind, knowing that they're really just going to get babysat. Sometimes putting them on the line can interfere with your own maneuvering, um, but, you know, that is really a small personal choice. Oops. We got more raiders coming down. That is kind of true. <laughs> it might be thematic, but man, is it feels bad. One of your best cards being cancelled by an enemy tactics card. It's like a counterplot with no roll, plus your opponent becomes weakened and has to shift. Super feels bad. So we got more raiders. Now, are they deployed at this? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. I, they're just kind of fast-forwarding a little bit, so just deploying on the line. And then it looks like Storm Pro is going next, which is good. Storm Pro is being the next most useless unit. They're probably just going to sit and camp. Uh, again, for anyone who kind of missed this, it's Jack and Hagar. Jack and Hagar probably there to uh, replace um, Grey Worm, should Grey Worm get killed. So you still score points of your commander. Ooh, in fact, I wonder if this is um, the plan, is to actually send Grey Worm forward aggressively towards the center. And then should you get overwhelmed, you can resurrect through Jack and just still score two points. That would be good, you know, because you really don't want to use a seven-point unit on a corner objective, it's just too big of an investment. And the pipemen are so good against uh, free folk in, in terms of um, A, tanking damage, and B, getting multiple attacks to break through their um, cheap wounds. So we've got a third unit of raiders. Great. I love what I see so far. Awesome deployment. Putting under the chaff. Not giving away where your strengths are. And they're pointing at the... Oh, they're pointing at the terrain, but I don't know... Oh, it's too close. That's why. Something happened. Ah, yes. When they flip the table, it must have not been locked. 
and the train's now too close to itself. Yeah, this bog, I believe, should be on this side. That's correct. So they have to unlock and move it over. Okay, cool. Train has been rectified. And um, back to the Targaryen. So at this point, he should probably throw down Jorah. Though honestly, putting down Pikemen down the center wouldn't be terrible either. His power piece is definitely the veterans. They want to deploy last. So I think at this point, it's okay to put down Grey Worm. I think he's going to be aggressive with Grey Worm. That would be a really good use of his commander to contest the middle. And um, I'm wondering how will uh, Bogler put down his pieces. So... Again, I think the stake is quite breakable. You can move first and then take the swords. I don't think your opponent's going to take the swords to stop you. And the question is, where will Mance go? So this is definitely a, a problem. Oh, they're still moving the train around. I wonder what's going on here. Maybe it's the stakes that's got to move instead? I can't remember. They'll fix that out, I'm sure. The question for me is, what does Mance do? Does Mance camp on a corner? Similar to the last scenario, Hone and Ready... You know, I randomly generated the scenarios, and uh, we got both five pointer or five objectives back to back. Um, Mance on a corner means you're scoring double points early, but it also means he's not influencing his friends and giving them better morale. Uh, so it is a tough question as to where to put Mance. I think he's left lots of tray shaped gaps in between his units, so Mance can really go anywhere, um, and. Yeah, you know, I am not the most experienced pre player, so I really don't know if there's a quote-unquote typical way to uh, deploy deploy things. So it looks like, yeah, they are moving the bog back to the right, and um, it should be Targaryens to deploy at this point. Okay, so he's, he's putting down... Okay. I like it. I like it. Putting down Grey Worm and Pikemen down the middle to fight for the center, again, with Set for charge, they can deal extra damage with shield wall, you can tank some damage. And as you hold the line, the veterans can come in and just sweep away anything that uh, that engages you. So he's realigning to make sure he's, he can march forward and not touch the bog, not get slowed down, which is good. Uh, attack scheme precision uh, is going to be better against him. It's better used by the free folk. Oh, and you know what? It's really cool. This stake... Even though I think Bogdan can blow it up turn one, he can activate and then use... So either he can take the horse, use Val to maneuver this unit, and then blow it up with their action, or he can use Val and then take the sword and then still activate as well. But either way, he might get slowed down a little bit, which could, al Ooh. Which could allow um, Obiscius to capture the center quicker. He can just do, you know, march into a maneuver... Whereas this, depending on the order of operations, can slow down the central advance. And that would be a big deal. Um, it would mean that, you know, um, Hibiscus could be controlling three objectives and his commander, means getting four points round two, versus maybe three points for Bogler. And only if he's camping Mance on the corner, which, again, has some inherent disadvantages, because you're not giving that beautiful morale level to just your army. So I think uh, Obiscius is committing to the center with Grey Worm. I think he should. I think to... If you don't, it's very hard, I think, to contest the center um, with with just uh, uh, veterans. Uh, so we've got... Okay, so trappers are going here. These are the naked trappers. You know, this is actually great for uh, Bogler because you're using a cheap activation to hold an objective. Uh, they're across from a non-range unit, so they're going to be pretty safe. They don't need the round bubble as a result. And they can still affect the game via their hidden traps. Uh, we've got Jorah going down. Cool. Jorah is going down uh, close to the front to provide rerolls with precision to Grey Worm. Um, back to the Free Folk. <clears throat> oh, okay. So Masra Mickey is saying that he should touch the bog. Is it to deny the Free Folk? charge bonuses to take less damage on the uh, pikemen. Yeah, 
And then we got uh, the Spearwives, the Power Piece. Um, interesting placement. I might have gone on the outer flank to do a wide loop with Harma's mobility. Uh, I feel like it's going to be hard to get juicy flank charges um, from this position onto the pikemen. So I might have deployed on the far right instead of central. I'm actually very happy Mickey's here. <laughs> I'm actually glad Mickey's here because Mickey can provide his expert insights onto free folk deployment and tactics. So thank you, Mickey. All right. So, uh, so yeah, Mickey's saying yes. You know, if you if you touch the bog and pivot so that your front is half covered, it forces the free folk player to have to set up the aggret in this matter. Um, okay, you know, you know what? With the deployment of the veterans on the far flank, maybe it's good that the spearwives are here because they would get wrecked um, by by a direct confrontation with the veterans. So maybe this is actually uh, just fine. And we got Mance going in a corner. So I've been asking this question for a while now, Mickey. What is your opinion about um, how to deploy Mance Raider in this kind of scenario being either uh, being either uh, Hone and Ready or Game of Thrones? Do you... And I guess there's no rule, right? There's no rule because you have to adapt to your opponent's list. You have to adapt to the deployment. But do you think that... Um, Smance should camp generally in the corner, or should he be deployed to provide the morale bubble? Generally speaking, as a as a general way of playing. Hmm. Okay. So you would have deployed him across to get the guaranteed two uh, guaranteed two points and safety, really, of your commander. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's a it's a tough one. And yeah, even, I think that when the rules change and commanders only score one, it will still be a tough one to decide what to do with your with with Manth in this case, you know, because you do. Actually, no, I guess not, right? Sorry, when the when the rules change, you'll probably not camp Manth. Any unit can score a point, so you just put them to provide the morale bubble at that point. Uh, we got drunk spleen. Is this spleen from Australia? The famous spleen. I was checking the time zones, and I think it's, um, <laughs> I would say famous. I think Spleen, uh, you know, was definitely one of the highest ranked rated feared players uh, in 1.6, um, and still very respected uh, in 1.7 as well. Morning, Rich. Happy Blade birthday again, sir. Okay, so uh, the game has started. We've got Targaryens going first. Uh, typical opening with Khaleesi onto the envelope, weakening the Spearwives, which is smart. And um, great play here. We've got Ygrette going onto the horse to get a free maneuver, uh, influencing nothing yet. And again, swords now can be used to destroy the stakes or their activation. Um, and at least, you know, you're free to push forward. So as I kind of predicted, these stakes are not going to play much of a role due to the nature of the two factions here. So Ygrette is going on Spearwives, pretty typical to make sure they have... Um, the extra super movement, or he decides he doesn't really need it and he's putting on the cav. This is probably a mistake because the cav can move 18 normally. Going down to 15 is not super significant. They'll pretty much be anywhere they want to be. If I had to put down the regret, I probably would put it on the Unsullied, honestly, um, to make it harder for them to uh, get to the center right away. So, yeah, I don't know if this was a significant influence, because this unit can still move 15 anywhere they want. Yeah, the veterans with Jorah support can shred a lot. I think um, yesterday's game between Tom Tyler, Winter's Coming, and Mitch, I think he literally killed 11 uh, Night's Watch crossbows. Uh, just with a double tap shooting. It was pretty awful. Unfortunately, Mitch didn't have shields to block some of the damage and get rerolls and stuff, but yeah, it was it was bananas. So um, we got Tycho onto the crown. Uh, he's going to target something that's far away from Mance. 
Uh, Mance is in the bottom right, so he's targeting the trappers down here. Um, and they fail due to the minus one, but only take one wound. These guys do not have the disorganized rule, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, no disorganized rule, so only one damage. It's going to take a while to wear this unit down with crown zaps. It might have been better to zap the raiders in the center, who are also away from Mance, but probably going to be more significant. And they take plus one damage, which is why I would have probably zapped the one in the middle. Um, so what will uh, Boggler do? Now, I would have probably taken the sword. I mean, I would have probably taken the sword to break the stakes. This way you... I mean... Yeah, it's a, you know, you don't have to break the stakes with the sword. Because you're not really going to move much far forward anyway, I imagine. But maybe you will. I mean, this is a bit of a long charge should uh, Obiskis get there first. So he's removing the weakened token of the Spearwives. That, that does make sense. I, I, I'm kind of 50-50 on which play was better there, weakened token or attack. Um, so we got great... Tactics board use finally. You know, I've seen lots of players in this tournament forget their NCUs. So we've got a pass with Illyrio followed by a pass with Val. And now we have the significant activations happening. I say it's significant, but it's round one and most things are too far away to influence each other. Stormcore Mercs are angling slightly to capture a corner objective and probably just camp for the rest of the game. I imagine we'll see Trappers do something similar. Yeah, what do you think, folks? Was it better to take the bag to remove the weaken on your power unit? Or was it more significant to blow up the stakes? I wish I could measure it. I think what would help me determine is how far is it to get to this um, objective in the middle. Now, maybe it doesn't matter because you can blow it up with your action. And then going first, you'll always get Val to take a fifth zone and you can maneuver for it anyway. So yeah, I think I think the bag is fine. Bag's actually probably better because it does remove the weaken off your power piece. Okay, so yeah, he's doing great, great. I love the flow of activations here. Uh, doing all the insignificant moves first, the ones that are obvious. So obvious moves are like capturing corner objectives, blowing up the stakes. I love it. Um, so stakes were here, now they're gone. Um, Obiscus should probably use his Freedman. Their job is just to be babysat. I don't think I would expose them. I would probably maneuver behind the Stormcrows. You're already in activation behind and you don't want to um, lose an activation more. All right, so, you know, a little bit exposed, you know? I mean, the thing is, this unit can come in to support and add extra attacks, but I think it's a little bit ambitious, a little bit ambitious. I would keep them perfectly safe. Okay, so back to Free Folk. And um, I imagine it's going to be Trappers at this point, capturing the corner point, moving forward. So the for anyone joining a bit late, uh, four cards are pretty insignificant, mostly melee stuff. There's only one card that's relevant, which is the plus one hand size, which is a very, very good card, uh, which Mance will probably park himself on. Uh, it is scary, you know, uh, Matt, you know uh, Mickey mentions that veterans, with Rokaro no less, this is a 10-point unit, um, can shred um, almost anything here. And in fact, Mance is in a very fragile unit of trappers, um, because they have a 6 plus save, I believe, right? I don't think they have a 5 plus save. Yeah, 6 plus save. They have morale 5, so unlucky to feel panic, but every hit will pretty much deal a wound. And this unit does have 14 dice. However, they are far from Jorah, but Jorah can easily redeploy. Um, one nice buff that Jorah got on top of his extra wound is extra movement as well. He's now moving 6. So he can go 18 downfield and then um, maybe influence or mark Mance's unit for the rerolls. It will be perhaps tough to set this up just because he is out-activated. So, you know, you can always activate... Trapper's last, 
and see how the veterans go. Anyway, uh, Bogdan's moving forward with the trappers in the corner. Again, a relatively insignificant piece. Um, the way you would want to probably incorporate them into the battle is I would probably pivot and try and get as close as possible so that your hidden traps um, can actually have an impact. Uh, this unit here should probably just maneuver towards the center. So I would have done a bit more of a pivot with these trappers and just put your bottom left corner on this objective to have a bigger influence with your hidden traps. And yeah, this unit I think should pivot and go towards... Ooh, very interesting. He is activating the veterans early, which I feel is a bit of a mistake because you're giving away where your power piece is. If you... He's going towards the middle, not going towards Mets. Very interesting. You know, because you can now, as Bogler, perfectly measure their threat ranges and just stay out. Whereas before, he couldn't do that. Now, he can actually start activating the units on the right side and um, react to those veterans. But yeah, this is the, the power piece. The pieces here were, like, very obvious. You know, I think Pikeman is just going to march forward 10. Jor is probably going to go behind behind this bog probably. So I would have done the obvious plays first and left the veterans to the end. Um, so we got, again, the Raiders. They should pivot and go towards the middle to participate with helping out with the center. Hmm. And he's just going forward. Uh, I don't know if he intends to fight Stormcrows or the or the uh, the the freed folk, uh, the freedmen. Sorry. Uh, he yeah, this is fine. I think this is fine. This is putting himself in a position where he can march forward and maybe charge freedmen down the road. So I think this position is actually quite fine. That that is really their goal. They're just here to hunt that unit. Which again, I would have probably put behind the Stormcrows just to keep him safe. Um, okay, so in return, we are back now to the last two activations from Obiskius. Uh He's an activation down, and he went first, so Bogler will get the last two activations. So again, these pikemen should just should just march forward. There's no real ranged attacks he's got to worry about. He just wants to contest the center. So again, I would have probably put Ygret on um, this unit to force them to uh, be a little bit further away. So now, yeah, with a 10-inch move, he's pretty much easy on the objective. With an 8-inch move, it would have been dicier to capture the center. Uh, he's moving very tentatively, though. I think he only moved uh, like 7 or 8 inches, I think. that I would have gone all the way forward. All the way forward. With Mance on a potential corner objective, you really can't afford to not put Grey Worm on an objective. Because uh, Bokler will for sure score 3 and you will only score one because these guys are not going to hold an objective, let's be honest, right? So Obiskius is now in a aggressive position. He has to be, you know, because he's going to lose the objective game. Um, and, okay, so I wonder, I wonder what Mance is going to do because those veterans are pretty scary and their threat range. So there's so many cool tricks with the veterans that you can do. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but um, I did. I think I did. I, I played Wild Card Carl, which I have so much trouble pronouncing, and he showed me what the potential of this unit is. I, I think I've already said that I thought they were kind of like Bastard Girls, where you can like shoot into a charge. So you move six, shift two, shoot. That gives you a 14-inch threat range. And then you charge in with your action. But you can do more. Yesterday, for example, Tom Tyler showed that you can move six, Shift two, shoot six with quick fire, and then as your action, shoot again. So you can double tap with 14 shots. Now you're hitting on fours, which isn't great, but if you've got Jor for rerolls, that's much more reliable, obviously. Um, or you can um, move six, move six, shift two, you've now moved 14 inches, and you've got a range of six. So it gives you a 20 inch threat range with a shot, which people may not be expecting uh, on a fragile solo like a dire wolf or jorah or freedman and um it's just a very flexible unit which i think uh, is is so fun to use and requires a high skill cap with elusive escape or swift retreat swift retreat they can also be hard to pin down and with rokaro with sentinel it gives them even more options to do funny movement shenanigans so 
I, I expect great things from this unit of veterans here. Uh, so it looks like Obiskis is pretty much done. And yeah, we get the last two activations from Spearwives and from this unit of Raiders. So it doesn't really matter which order he does it in now. Um, I don't think we've had any card play yet. Nope. No. Oh, we've had one card go down. Uh, what card did I miss here? Yeah, Obiskis took the envelope. Battle Endurance. Oh, wow. He's got Battle Endurance on the Veteran. So this card is, in my opinion, the card you want to play for Grey Worm. Um, so what it does is it gives you buffs as the game goes on. And what's crazy about this card is it works on ranged as well. So I'm right now actually experimenting with Grey Worm 2 and I'm putting it on Outriders with a Fortune Seeker. But yeah, rerolling your shots on your own, getting Sundering on your shot, getting Critical Blow, it really gets quite nasty as the game progresses. But of course, you need the game to progress. You need the game to actually enter the late rounds being really like four, five, and six, which doesn't always happen, especially in a scenario like this where your commanders can accelerate the points you get. Um, so that, that card has a lot of potential, and it'll be better in the next iteration when commanders don't score bonus points. So it's now down to Boggler to activate his last two units, and um, he is going first. I wonder if he... <laughs> so... With Jorah being here, I wonder if a 10-inch move... This is where, funnily enough, Ygret made a, would have made a difference. If um, a 10-inch move... No, he won't be able to threaten Jorah. But... Oh, I shouldn't say 10. It should be 12, right? With Harma, a 12-inch march could have gotten you a crazy charge. But it's probably bad because you kill Jorah, but then you lose your spear wives to uh, the, uh, the counterattack from the... Um, Veterans. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting a little too ahead of myself here. The Veterans have Sentinel to draw Karo, so they would get a free charge, and then they can still do their whole combo with shooting and attacking um, through other means as well. So yeah, I, I, you shouldn't go that deep in. It's gonna be, you should be patient. Patience. Patience, young one. Yes, patience. All right, so Mickey is saying that um, Targs can actually sit back. Um, maybe. Just bring Jordan and the Vets into the fray and start doing actions in the middle of the board. Yep, that's true. The Veterans can definitely just start one-shotting things. So yeah, my concern... My concern is that... Hmm. Yeah, the Spearwise are the big tooth for sure. Yeah, so I'm just thinking it from from the free roll perspective. You're probably going to score three points minimum. And it's all about then contesting the middle and living, right? If you can stop Grey Worm from capturing the middle, um, you're going to get a points advantage. And then it's all about can you not get killed by repeated attacks from um, veterans and issue commands and... All that kind of stuff. But yeah, you know, the, the downside of having nine activations as free folk is that you only really get four point units and one good unit. So it's pretty obvious that there's only one power piece here. Having said that, you know, repeated attacks from raiders over and over and over again um, with cards uh, can also do some damage as well. I'm sure, I mean, I, I, I can only imagine that pikemen must be terrifying for, uh, for free folk. If the pikemen were to get onto the middle, it's like, great, I charge them, they hit me first, they block damage, they hit me back, I'm probably dead. Especially with Mance in the corner, that middle unit of raiders is quite fragile. Yeah, I, I think Boggler's got to be patient with the Spearwives, right? You let, you let Obiskius um, engage and get the first hit but then you react with Sentinel and a charge to do some heavy damage in return. So it seems like he's trying to be aggressive. I don't know if this is the play, because if he moves 12 past his own tray, he can get a shot into a charge with the swords, 
But the problem is the veterans have swift retreat built in. So you're not tying them up. They can retreat and then um, charge and shoot back into you. Having said that, and I, I, I got I to gotta say it's becoming my, my catchphrase. Having said that, um, you know, you could do a lot of damage with the spear wires and maybe take off take off a rank. Um, but Obiskius does have both Illyrio and Tycho to quickly resurrect those wounds. So this might be uh, rather hasty on um, Bogler's part here. I think he needs to be more patient. You are not going to one-shot those veterans, and they have too much healing to um, to really burst through. Yeah, he's looks like he's going in for an aggressive turn two. He should probably make sure he can get a shot into a charge, though. I imagine he can. It looks like he can. <clears throat> the bad thing for him, though, is he's also going through the bog. So yes, he can get the full combo of shot into charge, but he won't have mance. Oh, he might have Stire. Sorry, Stire can give him the, um, the Sundering bonus uh, through the Tactics board. So he can get the Sundering and the extra attack, but he won't get rerolls uh, for the bug. Now, he might have, um, what's it called, Overwhelming Assaults? What's... He might have Overwhelming Assault, which would grant him rerolls back. Yeah, so I'm curious. Oh, yeah, let's let's zoom in here. They're measuring the shot into the charge. I didn't check that measurement. He should, he needs to get with an 8 to pull the combo. He doesn't want just a charge. Ah, uh, maybe, he, no, he doesn't want just a charge, right? He wants to do the attack. Ooh, okay. Because uh, if he does these swords into shot into charging volley, he will still have his activation to react to the flee of the... Um, veteran so let's see if there's going to be violence as the opening move here so uh, in terms of cards he kept oh he discarded a card okay he's discarding overwhelming assaults what? whoa are you not charging through a bog right now do you not want this card for the rerolls am i wrong whoa okay so he discarded a card um we discarded Lash Out and something else. I didn't see the second card, but uh, I'm happy to see both players cycling. Now, I don't know if you'd cycle Overwhelming Assault. I feel like this is actually a very important card, card to have right now. Um, unless they can't... I mean, I was going to say unless they can't do the attack zone into the charge, but then if you can't do that, if you pre-measured... Oh, he's shifting. What is going on? Is he playing... Oh, he's playing Swift Reposition. Brutal. Oh, wow. Swift reposition to get out of danger range. And now the spear wires are kind of high and dry. Oh, he's not playing it? Yeah, it looks like it's more than eight. When the grid came up, it is more than eight. Uh-oh. What? Okay, why would you come here if you couldn't get your combo? If you're using your activation to charge Jorah... First of all, you can't even charge Dora from this angle because you'd hit the uh, veterans first. If you couldn't do the attack into shot into charging volley, why would you come out here? I, I don't I don't like that. This is your power piece. This is the piece you gotta be patient with. <clears throat> right? Let the veterans charge your chaff. Okay, so he is playing swift reposition to guarantee the no shot into charging volley. He could, you're right. Good point, Ilya. He could have done that, yeah. I was obsessed with Steyr. But I guess it's moot now. It's moot. It's moot because he's for sure now no longer in range of the shift and shoot. And his power piece is stranded in the open. You know, part of this is learning um, counterplay, right? I don't think Bogler is too familiar with the Targaryen deck. He was surprised in his first game versus Steve about field control. So... If you knew about the existence of sort of reposition, you may not have taken this chance um, because it literally shoots down your plan, right? If your opponent draws that card, this unit is now kind of boned. Okay, so 
Um, he okay. This is kind of cool. He's not committing their activation. He's now going to use Val on the bag. I like this play. I like this play to put them into a threatening position, probably over the bog near Mance, so that if the veterans charge in, they won't get. Well, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> I was going to say they don't get rerolls, but you know, Jora is a thing. Scout openings is a thing. But I do like how he's trying to salvage scenario, and he's using it with Val on the bag to reduce healing. Is that the zone I would have taken? Because you might want the healing for yourself. Uh, I might have stopped Crown instead, in hindsight. You know, because at the end of the day, he has Illyrio and he still has Tycho. Okay, I, I like this. I like this. I like this play. I like this. This play. Okay. Why not you Grand Horse? I guess it, I guess it gives him options to play Endless Horde. It gives him options to... Yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah, you can't take the horse in fear of field control. That's actually a very good point. Um, he learned his lesson last game, how bad field control can be. But you know what? It's actually maybe good to use field control... To have him play field control against a potential maneuver. Because it leaves field control... It means you can't feel control the endless horde coming down the road, right? So he can't feel control everything. He only has two copies, right? So best used against a, a normal maneuver. All right. So um, it's now, it's now, uh, you know what? What if you just take a, sh oh, he's doing the order. I think he's going for it. I would have maybe taken the swords for, no, you can't. You can't take swords because swords means uh, he would get the charge onto you. So he's popping the order. Looks like he's going for the full combo. And again, yeah, the bog unfortunately won't help. Now he's looking to get into the flank, but he can't. That won't get a flank. So he's going to get this. This could be this could be bad. It's all about how good the rerolls are. You know, hitting on fours of rerolls means that three quarters. Okay, hold on here. I guess the question is, will he charge? You should charge. You should charge for sure. Yeah. So seven shots rerolling is three and a half. Like five hits, five hits with like a precision or two. Yeah, this is probably gonna do a lot of damage. And then you've taken the bag away from yourself now. Now I guess with um, with him committing his action with the veterans, it does leave the sword open for a free punch. Maybe he's got regroup and reform to heal back those spear wilds. Yeah, this is a uh, this is the dicey part where. The rerolls can either do very little, or it can literally help you destroy this unit in one go. So this is where the dice variance is going to come into play. Yeah, so I, he's not going to be able to get into... Oh, he might with a ship. I keep on forgetting how flexible this is. Yeah, so I think he will. I think a two-inch ship will get into a flank, which will just push through that little bit of extra damage. Oh, man, such a good unit. The flexibility of these guys is so good. So he should shift and he might get into the flank as a result Ooh, double shot without danny the charge isn't very appealing um i believe so yeah i believe harmers and mats is bubble okay so we got the volley of shots not bad. Not bad for a first volley. Brutal follow-up. Two precision and four hits. I think he maneuvered into the flank as well. It looks like this is probably on the line. So... Oh. Nah, it's definitely 11 six. Okay. Oh, that's precision. So he shouldn't be rolling six dice. Uh, it's at minus one, I guess, anyway. So they're all dead. So it doesn't matter. But yeah, he, he should remember precision. I'm guessing it's Obiskis' fault. Obiskis should really matter that there's uh, precision involved. Panic at minus one is a pass. Good. Good. And do you charge now? That was brutal. Six dead from just the shooting alone. I mean, uh oh, is this fire and blood? Fire and blood. Uh, I would go for the vicious, probably. Right? You're guaranteed in. You have rerolls because of Jorah. You don't need Sunring, so you're going for the vicious. 
yeah, that's obvious play there. Got to go for the Vicious. This card doesn't really matter because you're not going to overrun. Okay. Just for... Okay, yeah, that's dead. That, that's I think that's dead, and that's your biggest tooth. It's not guaranteed dead. It's not guaranteed dead. You could spike sixes and there's no vulnerable, but um, yeah, that was... However, I suppose the counterpoint is that you can bring the unit back with Endless Horde. No Harma, though, which is a big deal. That unit is dead. Most likely dead. I shouldn't say dead. Uh, why is he rolling two dice? What's happening here? Oh, traps. Traps, traps, traps. Got it. Okay, cool. So he took one hit from the trap. One wound from the traps. Okay. Okay. Seven attacks on threes. Rerolling with precision. Due to Jorah's order. Ah, uh, it's Ricaro, yeah. So no precisions yet. He's got to do six wounds. Okay, everything hit though. So he needs to roll two sixes to not die. And then pass panic, of course, at minus three. Um, looking for two sixes. Unlikely, but uh, not impossible. Zero six. Oh, one six. Not enough. One shot the unit. Oh, man, that is rough. And this was the unit with Harma, meaning you don't get Sentinel from something else to counter. Yeah, it was too ambitious, you know, and I think this is going to be a sharp lesson for Boggler. Um, I, I can see what he's trying to do. Even if he had made it uh, in with the shot into charge, it probably wasn't going to be enough because of Elusive Escape. Sorry, Swift Retreat with um, Rokaro and, sorry, the veterans and healing from Lirio and uh, Tycho. But yeah, with the swift reposition, it really sealed their fate. So uh, that's a point. And now, now the targs, I think, are actually firmly in control. He doesn't have anything to worry about now in terms of damage. It's just raiders and spearwives. Like, that's not enough. So now the targs can actually sit and camp, and it's up to the free folk to somehow break Grey Worm's pikemen. Yeah, that's pretty rough. And he's down in activation. It's now 8-8. Eight, eight. Right? Those spirits were not activated. So the plus side is that he's down to one card. What are the odds? It's field control. Can you bring them back right now with Endless Horde? Do you did you draw Endless Horde? You know, he did cycle through one card. He didn't play it round one though. Was he waiting for field control to come out before he played it? Yeah, it's that's the fear. Now, I know Mickey's stance is be fearless. You know, if he's got it, he's got it. Just go for it. Um, yeah, I hope Bogler can stay cool and play smart. But it is going to be a tough game for sure without your biggest tooth. Okay, looks like he didn't draw it. And he's digging now. Um... Yeah, this is going to be really bad. If I was Obiscius, I would literally just march onto the middle, draw a line in the sand of your spear, and say, come at me, bro. And you'll be getting four points a turn. Uh, four points a turn. So you'll be at five. It should be five, three at the end of this round. No, I would... No, 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 no. You should hold this objective. Yes, with horse. Actually, not even horse. Oh, and Val's gone. Wow. Okay, I don't know if I like this. Okay, no, it's it looks fine. It looks fine because even though he's not on the objective, I would have probably pivoted to make sure that your opponent cannot take the objective off you. But I think this is too long of a charge. But I might have pivoted to make sure that nobody can capture the objective. I would just put my tip on the middle so that no one else can capture the objective. Oh, he's reconsidering. Reconsidering. Is he not taking the horse? Taking the horse does... Oh. Oh. Okay, okay, okay. So rewinding a little bit. We're playing Wilding Diplomacy. He's probably going to choose the horse as a result. 
kind of bad timing here. You saw the future and saw him. Wait, 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 wait. Why is he tapping? Why are you tapping Khaleesi? Because let's say you choose, I don't know, horse and swords or whatever. You just take the last zone, right? Why is he tapping Khaleesi? That seems odd. You also lose your influence, right? That doesn't seem correct. He should have taken the third zone that was not declared to use the influence. Am I missing something? Yeah, I thought it was good play, but it was ambitious. I, I guess those Furos were always going to get crippled at very minimum. Yeah, it might have been trying to, you know, save an unsalvage, unsavable situation. Mickey, yeah, you, you might be right. Yeah, that sounds right. It's any zone? Oh, I'm thinking, am I thinking about the old one? Where is that card gone? Diplomacy. It's any zone. I thought you had to pick two. I'm thinking the old one, ain't I? Okay, yeah, I'm stuck in an old edition. Okay, so... Um, whoa. Star went onto the crown. Star went onto the crown. I don't see an effect of the zap. And I think he is mistakenly influencing this unit twice. <laughs> I think he's accidentally influencing the Raiders twice. You can't influence the same unit twice. What is happening here? Did he play a second Diplomacy? Where is his discard? Like, is, did he get a second Diplomacy? Where? Oh, here they are. Okay, yeah, so my bad. He It is any zone, man. Okay, and let's keep playing both. Very interesting. Using both this early, I don't like that. One was, I think, fine. The second one I probably would have saved for when he's going first. I think it's fine to use one, but then he didn't take the horse. Why did he take the crowns? Was he worried about the crowns? Up? Was he worried about trappers? I don't like that. You should have taken the horse. Because now you can still take the horse. You don't have a third diplomacy. Oh, man. And... Is he going to heal? Actually, healing probably makes sense, right? There's no pressure now to move up. Because, I mean, the Raiders... Yeah, the Raiders are not going to take the center. You're not going to get charged. Okay, so he's moving up himself. Yeah, I don't know. That second diplomacy kind of hurts my soul. Yeah, that would have made sense. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, uh, so Ilya, you're right. He can't go there. Um, so I'm saying that he might have charged, like a long bomb charge. But I guess a long bomb charge is bad, right? Because um, you'll eat the set for charge. Yeah, you're, right. you're you're probably right, Aaliyah. This is just as good as putting your corner on it because you're forcing him to charge you, and you kind of want him to charge you, right? This is the classic Leonidas, you know, Spartans 300s. Oh, oh. <clears throat> okay, so the Raiders... Wait a second. Weren't they already here? <laughs> Am I going crazy? Weren't they already, already here? More or less. Yeah, he's, he's being too... Passive, I think. I think he's being too passive. He might be a little bit rattled after losing the Spearwives. And using the second Diplomacy, I, I'm not a big fan of. Because he didn't achieve any significant effect. Because he still took the horse. So now we're doing the pass activations, essentially. Um, Stormcrows are coming closer. I mean, they can still use Unstoppable Advance to break the Palisades. Uh, to break the stakes if they want to, but yeah, at this point, it's Targaryens to win, and it's up to the Free Folk to, like, make some significant plays to break the, 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 the pikes. And the scary thing is, you know, these veterans are still lurking. <sighs> Jorah can usually swap and take that objective, and the veterans can help clear the middle. It's going to be hard. 
But you know what, though? You can never say never. Never give up. I thought the game between Winter's Coming and Spirit was in Winter's Coming's favor, and that game turned. You know, So anything can happen. I was playing a game the other day, and uh, my opponent, I think it was actually Sir Jacob, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I threw away uh, an advantage with bad with a bad decision. Um, I, I just gave away my outriders, and uh, you know you can be in a in a slightly positive position, and then just you know one bad decision can turn that around. So we'll see, we'll see. Um, okay, cool. So it looks like he's being a little more conservative with these freed folk freedmen. Sorry, just gonna lurk behind the storm crows. Uh, what's left? So we've got... So Mance is on an objective. So yeah, it looks like it's going to be probably 5-3. And it's going to be hard to catch up. 5-3 is a very big lead for the end of 2. Like you're already halfway to your scoring point, right? Um, at the very minimum, around end of 3, well, basically should be at 7. Um, and if he can hold the middle with Illyrio and Tycho, he will easily be at 9. So he just has to live. At this point, it's free folk who've got to put on the pressure because I think it's very likely Obiscus will be at nine by the end of three. Okay, so, oh, what's he doing? What? Why are you sidestepping? This is like a pass. Why are you sidestepping? You have to threaten the middle because he will just win through points. Nobody wants to charge Pikeman, but you have to actually put pressure on him. Not a fan of that move. You got to move forward. Yeah, yeah. The game was probably decided with that Spearwives push, unfortunately. And you know what? The funny thing is, based on the measurements, it doesn't look like he was even in range to do the shoot into charge. So I don't know why he committed that after pre-measuring. Jorah's coming to the side. Looks like, yeah, he's, you know, looking to replace. I don't know if I would have moved him right away. You do want his influence to have more range, his uh, order to have more range. You know, you may have wanted to use on the pikeman. Who knows, right? So I don't know if I like this. He has 18 inches of movement. He could have easily gotten on the objective at any point. <clears throat> yeah, so the thing is, I think what I would have done with the unit in the middle is I would have just pre-measured to say, okay, if if Grey Worm takes the center, which he likely will, um, what do you need to charge him? And I would have made it an easy charge. I would have made it, like, you know, a 2 plus charge. He's not charging off the objective. So you just want to make sure that you can gang up, literally gang up with three units. So here comes Grey Worm, last activation. Yeah, they're fully activated now. He is moving, ooh, sorry, pretty far forward. And he is kind of surrounded, you know, like, ah, this could be bad. No, the problem is the veterans are right here. Whatever gets sent in to fight Grey Worm will get blown up by veterans is the problem. Okay, he's, yeah, he, he had a weird angle at first, but now he's just barely covering it. And you know what? He can probably angle to keep only one unit in the flank. Um, that looks pretty close. I think they're barely in the flank. They're either on the line or slightly on the flank. So, and I think this unit is in the front. Yeah, so, and who's first next? Okay, so, <sighs> Obiscus is first next, which means that <clears throat> he will also finish first, and it's possible that Bogler with some aggressive plays end of three can maybe set up a powerful start of four. The problem is the Targaryens still have all their healing, Illyrio and Tycho or thing. However, you know, Illyrio probably won't heal much, right? If we're going to be going to the tax board first, it's probably just Tycho. And the nice thing, too, is that... Um, you know, start of three, the swords is actually not going to be super significant, which is good, which will reduce the damage coming onto Bogler. All right, so um, that last card is being held. This is Fire and Blood, right? Okay, Fire and Blood is still there. Uh, Bogler looks like he discarded not much. 
So I see... What is this? One... Oh, Long Plan! Okay, he played Long Plan. Uh, who had the envelope? I believe... Bogler did, right? Bogler had the envelope. Does it matter? No, it does not matter. It's end of the round. You can look for one card. So let's see what one card he chose. Um, Obiskius did not discard that card, which, you know, like a poker play kind of makes you wonder, if, is that is that in uh, field control? And controlling that objective, he draws an extra card. So he's gone through eight cards. Not bad. That's not bad at all. Okay, so opening play from... Um, Obiscius. He looks like he was going to go for the envelope, which makes sense. He doesn't need a horse, doesn't need a um, attack. Okay, so he's taking the envelope to draw more, and he should probably put weakens to blunt the damage coming at Grey Worm. He's checking distances. Yeah, Bogler's just a little bit far out. Now, the good news is he's got horse and Val, and even a field control will still put units in a dangerous position. Uh, interesting how he does that. I would just press two, but you know, he eats their own. <clears throat> and he put a weaken on this unit in the flank here. Okay, cool. Uh, I think you take the horse. Either you take the horse and you eat the field control, you might lose Endless Horde. Um, but the shift can still put either of these two units into a dangerous, a more dangerous position to actually engage the pikemen. I think you gotta take the horse here. And we've got Endless Horde. And we've got Field Control. Womp womp. The middle one is Precision, I believe. The middle one is Precision. Okay, this is not the worst. I mean, yes, you lost Field uh, Endless Horde. That does suck. But you do get to shift forward with one of the two units that is unlikely to make it in. Um, I would probably do the central one. And I would put Ygret on this unit over here. I would probably shift up this unit to make sure you can get into charge range. And I would put Ygret here to A, ignore the bog, and B, add that plexter movement to get into, 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 into the charge range. Okay, so that was that was sadness. And the sword's gone. Um, that was probably the card he drew of long plan as well. But, you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. Uh, Abyskius? Whoa! He's gone through ten cards? Big props, big props. I, I'm really, really proud of players who know how to churn through their deck, know which cards to get rid of. So, you know, it's unsurprising after going through half his deck that he's able to get field control. Good odds to have one of those two copies in your front half. So, um, how does Obiscus respond? Now, what would I do, right? You've got, oh, he, never mind. Uh, he's already taken the bag to remove the weaken off Grey Worm. I believe Grey Worm was weakened. I saw him take hearts off the Freedman, but they should have zero hearts on them, uh, as far as I know. Okay, so we got Ygret onto the crown. Uh, she should probably crown zap the Freedman, which she does, and does a wound. Again, Freeman, despite being garbage, are not disorganized, so they don't take extra damage from Panic Test, which is pretty crazy. Um, they have five more wounds. It's going gonna, it's gonna to require quite a few more crown zaps to kill them. And then we got the Illyrio Heal, looks like. Illyrio Heal uh, to remove that wound, I imagine. Wait, am I crazy? Hold on here. <clears throat> he went first. He took Envelope. Envelope into crown, into bag, into, sorry, envelope, into horse, into bag, into crown, into Illyrio. Did Illyrio not do anything? Illyrio should have healed that wound. Unless I'm getting the activation order wrong. Uh, yeah, Obiskis well, went first. So he had last say in the tactics board. And again, you should pass a vow. Val's right here. You don't need to commit on the board yet. I mean, if you are to commit on the board, use trappers. But you have Val to pass with. You've got Val to pass with. I don't think anything is super priority right now. You don't need to charge. You probably want to pass. Yeah, and I feel like Illyrio was not used to heal that, that wound. Probably won't make a big difference, but, you know, every little thing matters. 
Oh, onto the veterans. Oh, good call. Sorry, Spleen. Yeah, good call. They had a wound from trappers. Now it's gone. Good call. <laughs> okay. Uh, look at all this measuring. Okay, so he's checking to see. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. So Ygritte did go on the, uh, on the unit by the bog. That's good. Um, it looks like it's an 8 or 9 inch charge. 9 would be a 3 plus with Ygritte on you. And yeah, look at that unit in the middle. Unit in the middle, I wonder if he didn't shift with field control. It looks like he probably um, put the weaken on a unit that already had weakened to not suffer the penalty. But that unit in the middle now is pretty far. Like, it's 9 and change. I think he can pivot to make it 9. But that's still a 4 plus charge, which is not ideal at all. Not ideal at all. Now, let's assume that um, Boggler is able to get three charges into these pikemen. What's the order you do it in? I think you activate this one first, right? If these guys go in, uh, the one with Stire, I mean, it's a bit sad. Oh, is he? Did he feel the charge? I think he failed the charge. I don't think you just march, right? Okay, I didn't see a dice get rolled, and if he just marched up, this is a really bad play, because it actually lets the pikemen charge the raiders and stay on the objective. Now, would I do that? This movement does block the pikemen from pivoting, but let me think here. <clears throat> if you charge the pikemen in, you have the center, you pull a bit further away from this unit with your Gret. I wonder if he can back up. Did he barely cover in the middle? If he can back up and pivot, he might be able to... Nah, I don't think so. I was going to say he might be able to block a charge somewhere, but it depends where the middle objective is as well. Okay, so... Um... So Obiskius did three, four activations. Bogler did two, three. He's on his fourth. He forgot about Val. He still, he definitely forgot about Val. Oh my gosh. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Tell me this unit's charging. Okay, it's charging. Okay. Oh, no. That is a fail, brutal. So, yeah, that is game. That is game. Because there's no way this unit is going to contest the pikemen. And that's going to put Obiscus at 9. And that's that's game. Uh, Obiscus doesn't even have to use these veterans. I mean, he should. He should just go out and kill something. Jora can take the side objective. But he's going to score 9. Yeah. He needed to contest the middle. He needed the god hand of, like, old woman. What? Was it auto in? Did he reroll? What's going on here? I wonder what happened. This is now a five. <laughs> this is now a five. It used to be a one. I wonder if... I wonder if... Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I wonder if he, he let him reroll to make it more interesting. Now we have a game. Okay, now we have a game. Now we have a game. So now the interesting question for me, I would have... Uh, hmm, I was going to say I would have gone deep. I would have gone deep. Maybe not. If you go deep, the Freeman can actually... No, they can't charge. They've already activated. Um, we've got... Looks like... Oh, he's attacking first with uh, set for charge. I was going to say, do you pivot? You probably don't pivot. You don't pivot. Sorry, when I say pivot, I mean realign, because if you realign, you expose your rear to this other unit over here. Uh, so you got six hits. Six hits? Don't they, oh, they throw eight dice because of uh, boldness and courage. That's right. So we got seven hits. Seven hits saving on fives. Only one. So it does peel off a rank. It does peel off a rank. Oh, and they're weakened too. But that's okay. I was going to say it's okay because you really... Seven wounds. What? Man, they feel their panic. Uh, 
I see seven hits. Seven hits. Six saves? He should have made one more dice. It doesn't matter, I guess, right? He would have lost at least eight guys, so he should be down to his last rank either way. It's still probably GG. Even, even with that charge, it's still probably GG. <clears throat> uh, yep, he swings back. He does get the charge bonus. So, is there a card? Okay, hold on. Is he re-rolling? Is there a card that's re-roll charges? Am I... Oh, re-rolls did nothing also. So two hits with Sunring in the flank is saving on sixes. And the weakened token is used. Okay, he at least hit both. What do you think happened there, folks? Do you think he let him re-roll to make it a game? I, I, he definitely rolled a one. I don't think there's a reroll charge card. Uh, and they pass or panic without a problem. Oh, so that was armor. That was armor, I believe, right? Is he doing... What is this? Hold on here. I'm a little confused. And they died? What? happened how did they get killed he charged in he took a huge set for charge he rolled dice to attack he got two hits i think he should have lost one he rolled a six he should have lost one and then they just died what am i missing here folks there's no crowns app he lost one, but why did the free folk die afterwards? He already made his panic test, right? What just happened? I am confused. I wonder if he made him take a second panic test for some reason. Like, maybe he forgot he already took a panic test. Okay, so now they're activating. I was going to say, too, maybe they activated an attack and just finished them. But they're activating now. Like, I am pretty confused with what happened there. No, he's charging in. So he... I don't know what happened there. Okay, now, the bright side is it probably doesn't matter, right? The reality is, um, with Tycho especially, Grey Room's going to hold the middle. Ooh, interesting. He has to go 50-50. The good news is... I mean, not good news. The, as much as I'm confused about what happened there, it probably doesn't affect the end results because with Tycho, even with this charge here, Tycho will probably bring them back up to um, three ranks and he will hold the middle and be at nine. I don't think he popped Shield Wall. The fact that he took a wound means he didn't pop Shield Wall, which means he can still use it against these Spear Wives. Now, does Shield Wall have restrictions? Uh, front or flank. Yeah, so very few restric restrictions. You can be doubly engaged. Doesn't really matter. <clears throat> so Grey Room's going in. And interestingly enough, the precision card's actually making a difference here. Uh, I don't know why he rolled a dice separately, because he doesn't get re-rolled. Oh, he does get re-rolled. Daenerys. My bad. Okay, so it should be one precision and six saves. But yeah, I really want to ask them what happened with that unit of raiders on the side. Why did they just die? That seems very strange. Uh, six saves into fives. Not a good roll. Loses six dudes plus a panic test. Oh, counter strike! That's right. I'm dumb. Grey Worm on top of Bolds and Courage has counter strike. So all those misses, yes, 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 this makes sense. They died due to Counter-Strike. Okay. <laughs> they died due to Counter-Strike. Okay, so the world makes sense now. They died due to Counter-Strike. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh my gosh, this unit is really cool. <laughs> this unit is really cool. 
Um, that is pretty brutal. So with Counter-Strike, I think they failed their panic as well. This unit charged... Oh, no, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Grey Worm charged in and killed eight with the failed panic. Okay. Counter-Strike. Yes. Okay, so last ditch effort. We need crippling damage here. Uh, I don't know if they rechecked if it's the flank or not. It looks like it could be the flank. We're going to assume it's the flank here, folks. Um, oh, we got to see. It is the front. That is the front. And he's not yet popped shield wall. So the rest of the game at this point, I think, should be academic. Um, they should charge in the front. They should bounce off due to shield wall. Abyscus should score five, four. Should score four points. Um, Bogger will score three. It should be nine, six. And then the last round of the game, like, Bogdan will score nine points, to be fair. But he will probably still lose. And the funny thing is, these veterans... I mean, I would have maybe pre-measured this 12. Maybe not. These veterans can contest Nance, potentially. Yeah, so what... Mm, what would I do? Would I go for the Mance kill? I probably would. With a 6 plus save, yeah, I probably would. I would probably move forward with Jorah, target Mance, shoot charge, and then take the objective. And that would be game, actually. That would be game. Okay, so Raiders made it in. Uh, they're hitting on threes due to uh, gang up. We've got six hits. Six hits. Oh my god, great. Great. <laughs> Sorry, Biscius, because it's exciting. Um, he missed once only, so he should, he should lose six guys. And you know what? With a failed panic, he may not hold the middle. Is there anything that can be done about that? Now, this is crazy. He rolled six dice and failed. It's like failing six coin flips. It's what? Two to the power six? What is two to the power six? Is that 64? One in 64 chance of that happening. Uh, one dice in return? What is that one dice all about? It's not Counter-Strike, right? What's happening here? Why did he roll one dice? Don't they have a four plus save? Did he not fail all those dice? I mean, this would be a fail anyway. Okay, let's see how many does he take off. He had lost one. He lost. Oh, he's doing shield wall now. Duh, of course. So he only lost three. That makes sense. Okay, so a failed panic could still make this contestable. No, it can't. If he loses three, Heiko can still bring him up. Uh, oh, and we got Lash Out. Lash Out will deal two wounds here, probably, to kill an activation, or try to. <clears throat> yeah, Shield Wall went down. So yeah, even the failed Panic Test, which I don't think he's rolled yet, um, Taika will bring him up to five, or up to three ranks, and uh, he'll still control the center. Now, the question for me is, do you do Jora up here, Scout openings on Mance, and try and blow up Mance. If you do that, you can take his objective, and then you score one point for killing Mance, brings you to six, and then you got four points from holding. He could literally end the game this, this round. I would totally go for it. Like, you're still not likely to lose, so I would totally go for the action play here. Tycho gets popped. I think they forgot to roll Panic. I think they forgot to roll Panic there. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I think Spleen, you know, he's so far ahead. Even if he doesn't kill Mance, he'll still be up eight. He'll still contest, right? A shot into a charge will for sh No, nah, I shouldn't say that. I mean, he's likely to contest. Can he kill eight models with 14 attacks re-rolling with precision? 
Probably. <clears throat> um, yeah, so you should be able to contest this. So it'll be at a minimum 8-4 probably, but he could literally win the game right here. Is he not popping Tycho? I'd go for the win. Let's wrap it up, boys. I would go for the win. Just because he's so far ahead. It would make the game a little more exciting. Uh, there are just no good plays left for Boggler, unfortunately. Those trappers like could charge, but they won't be able to contest charging over stakes. Okay, we have a second card being played. Is this Regroup and Reform? Doesn't matter. Yeah, you, you healed four wounds. I guess he was checking to make sure he could not get attacked by these Storm Crows. But yeah, that, that shouldn't matter, probably. Oops. Um, I think this game's pretty locked up. Yeah, I, I, I would put Jorah a little bit closer to, to uh, scout openings and then just finish him. I think I think Obiskius was just checking to see if there's any outs left. <laughs> the answer is I don't think so. There's no Harma, no Sentinel. You just move Jorah. I I, I would play aggressive. I, I, I'm curious what Obiskius does, but I would uh, I would go for the aggressive play here. You will probably cripple Mance one way or the other. Oh, we got some card play. Uh, card play, unstoppable advance. Even better. Let's just ignore that bad terrain. So, oh, this is a mistake, though, I think. He's activating now? You really want the rerolls from Jorah. Uh, yeah, I I think he's trying to kind of 50-50 it, where he's going to do the attack and then control the objective. But I think with the rerolls, you would have just straight up killed Mance. <clears throat> he might still straight up kill Mance, to be fair. But no, no, no. It's the shot. The shot is now not rerolling. So your seven shots only hit three or four times. <clears throat> and then with seven attacks, you don't have the weight of dice to actually remove 12 wounds. Whereas the shot with rerolls could have removed 12 wounds because of their six plus save. <clears throat> yeah, I uh, I think he's... Uh, he's playing it safe. You know, he's, he's making sure he's going to be at nine either way. Um, but again, I think it's a bit unnecessary because... You're so far ahead. Whether you're at 9 or you're at 8 is virtually the same at this point in the game. Uh, he's going for the shot. I wonder if he'll be rewarded with good dice anyway. Uh, he's doing the traps now. Sure. Deal two hits. Yep, he's trapping. Uh, I don't know if they rolled. Maybe he rolled. I didn't see. He took a wound, looks like, from the traps. He's popping the quick fire. Oh, he didn't even use Recaro. I don't know if he was in range to use Recaro. He didn't need the range, let's be honest. This is a case where, you know, you can see that this unit has a lot of potential, but he didn't even really use this extra two points. Okay, so we got seven shots hitting on fours. And this is... Oh, only two hits. Yeah, this, this means... What? Did he pop Jorah? How's he getting rerolls? Uh, that's six. He did fail all six. How is he rerolling his shot? Jorah does not seem to be pop. Plus, the precision didn't kick in. How is he rerolling his shot for his ranged attack? Confusion. Panic is passed. <clears throat> How did he re-roll the shot? This is a big mistake, because this is going to get him the win. He's doing another Fire and Blood just to, you know, guarantee the kill. What do you take? Vicious, I guess? He only gets one. I guess you go for re-rolls, actually. Right? The Vicious means they're testing on seven, unlikely to fail. You want re-rolls for yourself, so you want to just make sure you... Uh, 
get that charge in, but I don't know how he rerolled that shot. He had two hits into six hits. Uh, he's rolling a dice. Counter strategy from Mance. Counter strategy from Mance. Okay, fair. So he's rolling the charge. He's good anyway. Uh, yeah. Does anyone know how the veterans got rerolls for their shots? That seems strange because, yeah, it seems like a mismatch. He didn't take the precision hits, so it's not Jorah. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll find out. I mean, I'm not going to ask. You know, if the players made a mistake, it's on them to really catch that mistake. Okay, uh, not a fantastic roll. He's got to do six hits. Oh, God, he did seven hits. This should be GG. <clears throat> GG, end of three. Sixes. Nope. Exactly enough to kill Mance. And that is now game. He gets a point. He'll surge onto the objective. So it is now game. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I guess I'll jump into the Discord. Uh, as soon as I see the last few movements, I'll see the score pop up. But that is now GG. Obiscus. I really don't know how to pronounce that name. Obiscus. Yeah, so with that kill, he's going to be 11, right? It's going to be 11. He's going to control 4 plus his commander. Yeah, so that is pretty much game. I predict we're going to hear about Spearwives. <laughs> Spearwives, and uh, I think I have to ask him about the uh, the positioning. Why did he move so far forward? So, um, yeah, that's going to be the question. All right, folks, let me put myself on mute, and let's hear what they have to say. Um, so good. Hey, how you doing? Hey, Arrakis. Mystery. Mystery solved. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, Alrighty, so we've got the players um, uh, on chat, and I want to say thank you for the game, folks. It was exciting to watch on a Sunday morning. Uh, we got a very quick resolution, end of three. The score is 11 to four, I believe. Yeah, 11-4. And so uh, let's start with Bogler first. I think, from my perspective, the the biggest impact on the game was the Spearwives um, getting killed right away round two. So my question for you, Bogler, is I noticed that you very aggressively pushed them forward end of round one, and I thought you were setting up a shot into a charge start of two. Was that the plan? Were you in range? Because when I checked... Uh, following your, your your measurements, it looked like you might have been a bit out even. So tell us about what the Spearwife play was. That was exactly it. it. Um, I, I knew I couldn't really go into the, the the Unsullied Pikemen because, as you saw, they basically deleted a unit of raiders before they even got to attack. So I thought we'd try to make a game of it and go after the riders here, which would have required uh, maneuver and then a shot, but uh, having two wildling diplomacies in my hand, he didn't actually choose any of his NCUs. He just went for the shot and uh, kill on the Spearwise, which was basically just giving it to him. But honestly, no pain, no gain. I'm still happy with that play. I would never do it again in the future, but I'm still happy with the play and the result. Um, Game of Thrones is really, really good. It seems like someone's gonna win at turn three or four, no matter what, just the way the objectives are. So, yeah, just that. I okay. think it was partially that I swift... I think I swift... Repositioned, repositioned yeah. Back a couple of inches that I think stripped them from you as well. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, um, I, I think if you could have got the swords into shift shot charge and crippled the veterans, I think you might have been in a, in a fine position. But Obiscius really... How do you pronounce that name, by the way? 
Yeah, that, that works. works. Obiscus, okay. Obiscus yeah. really sealed sealed that play off with that swift reposition backwards. And it's tough, you know, if you if you don't know the Targaryen deck necessarily, if you didn't expect that card, that really throws the wind out of your sails because, you know, you've got a big play planned and then this one card kind of cancels it. And then we saw, of course, the, the super feels bad moment of um, field control stopping and sword again as well. So, uh, Obiscus, tell us about your game plan and tell us about, you know, what, what your thoughts were going to the game. Yeah, so I went in knowing I was going to be down activation. Uh, I think it was just one, though, from the start, which wasn't the worst. Uh, my plan was pretty much, you know, Mercs try and sit on an objective just so I'm getting some points. And Sully'd start creeping towards the middle because they're pretty tanky, I think, as we saw, and uh, can just do a ton of damage on the way in, especially if you get if I can get Danny on them first. And then... The vets were just to support um, Recaro. Giving them Sentinel can be really deadly, um, especially coupled with the pikemen. If you position wrong when you charge the pikemen, uh, you can get hit by the pikemen on your way and hit the pikemen and then get charged by the vets, which should evaporate most free folk units. So that was pretty much it. The, the vets were going to just flank around pretty much and right right and they did a great job they were just deleting things with, like they literally one shot the spear wives and mance uh with their with their action which is pretty crazy um i i have to admit i don't know gray worm really well so when bogler charged you in the flank and then killed himself i was like how did that happen i didn't i didn't realize that uh gray worm had counter strike so yeah it was brutal he took the set for charge took like six wounds from that and then the the counter strike finished him off pretty much. That was a horrible, horrible uh, outcome for those for those raiders. Yeah, I didn't. The the weekend also didn't help. Oh yeah, that's right. Yes, char- yes. charging gray worm one weekend can just you end up taking more wounds than you do. Even uh, even you know sundering in the flank. Cool. Well, you know, um, it, it, it taught me a bit about Grey Worm. It makes me want to play him even more. I've been experimenting with him, actually. But, uh, yeah, that was that was uh, uh, a really cool insight into how to use Grey Worm. And I think Bogler learned a lot as well in terms of, um, uh, you know, what sneakiness Targaryens can have. And honestly, it's, it's really good to learn that because Targaryens, I feel, are very hot in the meta. You can even see that in this event, they are the majority faction. So learning all their cards and learning all their cool little tricks. The veterans in particular are a very powerful piece that have so much utility, so many different tricks. Um, I think playing against this many Targaryens for Bogler is a good experience to like really uh, understand one of the more powerful and popular factions right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah for but sure. Grey, Grey Worm's deck with vets can be quite nasty, especially because of how Grey Worm's battle endurance works, mm-hmm. if you can get it off. Because it works on their shots and their uh, their melee, yes. they just start ramping up like crazy. Is there a clever way to use issue commands with the order as well? If you remove the order token, yeah. is there a cool thing you can do with it? I'm trying to think, but I couldn't come up off the top of my head a cool combo. So if if Mance hadn't died here, my <clears> plan was, because I had issue commands in my hand, uh, I they were within 12 of Grey Worm. So I was go- if Mance hadn't died, I was going to turn back on Quickfire. And then if Mance attacked them, they'd retreat back and just shoot him. Oh, to man. Right. Because you did charge him for Mance. Yes. Before Mance activated. That's true. Yes, yes, yes. That's pretty good. Um, this, there's a lot of orders in this army. They have three. They have two. It's, uh, there's a lot of room for a few commands to do stuff. Cool. Yeah, I, I never thought about that. That's a good use for um, for the order on the veterans. Yeah, that that's pretty clever. Well, uh, thanks again, gentlemen, and um, good luck in your next games. Thank you for the show. Yeah, thank you. For the viewers and for science, all worth it. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I ask about the charge reroll? Um, what charge reroll was it? So I, I, I oh. kinda, yep. Are you talking about when he rolled a one and then he rolled? So oh yeah, kinda, yes, yes, yes. So he flanked you. So, I thought he rolled a one first. So he put he put the he just he moved the die over and dropped it and it kind of rolled. I don't usually count that. I usually like actually put it down then roll. I find it's because uh, otherwise it you know you aren't intentionally rolling. 
So, I understand. Okay, yeah. It I, I, like I, 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 I told him to just roll again. Okay, cool, cool, cool. It, we were curious because it looked like a roll, but you're right. I, I've had that happen where you drop the dice and it rolls on its own. It's so weird because it's like a virtual environment, but the dice act like real dice. You know, I've had the dice like land cocked and like why does why do virtual dice land cocked you know so yeah i, I can yeah. see what happened there okay awesome to, right. to me it's like it's like in real life if you drop a die like you're yeah your yeah, dice yeah for sure you that's don't you don't count kind of drop dice, dice. That absolutely kind of yeah yeah oh that makes sense okay cool we were we were curious so thank you for the explanation um thanks again gentlemen good luck in your next games and we'll see you guys next time thanks thanks so obi Alrighty, folks thank you for watching um yeah, just uh, you know, I, I gotta say that was a, that was a cool game to watch. I learned a lot about um, Grey Worm. I, I, this is actually the commander I'm working on right now to uh, learn more about. I'm playing a lot of Drogo and Mother of Dragons, and it's just getting kind of boring. I want to kind of try to get through the other Targaryen commanders. Um, and yeah, maybe Mickey one eventually can give us some insight as to what he would have done in the situation. It looks like a bad matchup. Now that I've seen the game play out, it seems like that was just a bad matchup for the Free Folk. I don't know what they do about Unsullied Pikemen. That unit seems monstrous against the conventional raiders and Spearoids and stuff. Um, I don't know if maybe the Spearoids have been saved, if they could have done significant impact, but yeah, Pikemen just seem horrible into Free Folk. Um, not much you can do about that. And, and, and veterans too, unless you play super defensive... The veterans just seem to have so much burst potential against uh, free folks. So I would be curious to uh, to hear Mickey's thoughts on that one day. Um, but yeah, pretty much that's it. Thank you, everyone. Have a great one, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye bye.